So I saw a comment the other day that said, Teacher, you need to complain more about Sword and Shield. Listen, if you got complaints on the game, if you played through and there's stuff you legitimately dislike, feel free to talk about it on Twitter or whatever. I'm not going to go out of my way to criticize something and say I hate something about the game. What everyone needs is for the next Pokemon game they make to be something totally trash. Something where there's no character development at all. Something where you don't for, you're you not foreshadowed the legendary in the beginning. It's just thrown in the middle of nowhere. And you're a kid who's participating for no reason. And your power is not believable. Everything I've complained about in rants. About the main character's power being unbelievable in every single Pokemon game. They made right in this game. They showed you why you're powerful. They gave life to all the gym leaders. They're not statues. They didn't spoil anything in the trailers. It was an experience for you to enjoy. If you stayed away from the leaks. They removed Megas from Gen 6. And everyone complained about it. And instead of removing Galarians after Gen 7. They brought back in regional variants. And because all the things that they did do are there. People are going out of their way. To find things to complain about. I promised myself if something messed with me. And I didn't like in this game. That I would point it out. Nothing has messed with me yet. I'm appreciating every single part of the game. The development of every single character. No one, it's like in X and Y, you had Tierno and stuff. It, it went nowhere with those characters. There's so much life and actual passion poured in the game. The story writers clearly had a direction going. They rewrote the story like two to three times to get it right. The legendaries foreshadowed in the beginning. The gym leaders pop up for a term at the end. There's so many good things. Everything is so amazing in this game. And instead of praising the good that Game Freak did, people want to go out of their way. If you want to do it, feel free. People want to go tell me to go out of my way to start criticizing things, look look for things to complain about in the game. Listen, if they don't fix that tree in the next game, I don't care. What people need is for them to take away everything they've done in this game, the development, every set of, bit of passion they poured, and just make another game like they did like the last few years. And then you'll realize everyone will be like, wow, Sword and Shield was the best game ever. Why can't they do that again? They literally did this before with Black and White, trying to make the story fun. And it, it failed. And everyone's like, wow, we need a game like Black and White again. And they do a story game that's well. And it just goes totally underappreciated. I don't care if you dislike the game. And you want to complain about it. Don't tell me to complain about it. If they make the next Pokemon game. And it has character development, soul and all the characters. An actual good story. They make your power believable. They break the formula while they won. So that I'm not even done the game. But they cut the champion battle just before we find out who's champion. That's like a fanfic idea. But no, oh, it's already done, so now let's look for other things to complain about. If they make another game with the same passion poured into it like Sword and Shield, I don't care if, they, if the tree looks just as ugly. I don't care if the characters disappear in the background. That's me. Maybe you care about it. I have The only thing I've complained about is the national decks. And I can complain about it. And I've told that, yeah, it's not a good idea because people won't see the game for what it is when there's this thing that people don't like in the way. You want me to find some real complaints? I'll give you two things. One, Raihan's gym was a little too simple. But that was the point of it. He's just training characters. And two, I hate Dora Lora. I wish he had a different Pokemon. What do you want me to complain about? I hate that people are telling me to complain about the game because I'm saying so many good things about it. That's fake. You know, people complain because it's fun to do. People will be like, go on Twitter. Oh, wow, Team Yellow is the most pathetic team ever. I don't know if they tweeted that. I've hidden from the internet except from the comments here that I, that I read from you guys. If they want to tweet that Team Yellow pathetic, sure. Go for it. A different side is how cool it is to have an evil team like this instead of having Team Galactic and then the same team again and Team Flare. They're taking all these different paths. They're making a, a red herring team. Team Yell. The leader is a gym leader. He's a super fan of his little sister. It's it's freaking fun. But, oh, wow, it's it's pathetic. It's This is not how evil teams used to be. If that's your idea, fine. I'm enjoying the game for what it is in such a my own way that's making the game amazing actually wrote things that I liked about the game. People are trying to find things to criticize need everything taken away in the next Pokemon game to realize how great this game is. Does it have flaws? Yes. Do I have anything to complain about? No. I remember writing notes about things I loved about the game so much. And meanwhile, people tell me to complain. One, the atmosphere. Like when you're in the final stadium and you hear that big bassy music as if you're at one of those conventions or you're at a party or club or something. You just get filled with that adrenaline like this is a crazy place. Or even a stadium. When you go upstairs, it all muffles out. It's it's such a good taste for the atmosphere. I wrote that the characters have so much development. Hop questions his own self. His spirit becomes crushed in the story. He becomes weak because he keeps hyping himself up as the champion's little brother. And then after he sorts his head, he becomes the strongest trainer 
that matches your speed and you two become the first two to beat the gym challenge. Marnie has her goal to bring back the town. Bede is one of the craziest characters. He's straight up evil. He's snotty nose. He's in denial when he loses. And he causes so much damage to Hop's mentality that you as the main character hate him and are waiting to get revenge for something to happen to him. And when something does happen to him, it's not fair. His spirit gets crushed in the same way and you feel for him even though he's the villain. And then they make him... They tell you the backstory where he's this orphan because his parents left him because they had no money. And then he gets picked up by Chairman Rose. And then Chairman Rose disowns him. So it's like, what would that do to his mental structure? What, 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 when does this happen in other Pokemon games? Then you proceed through the game and that ugly gym leader recruits him. And it's so amazing. And then he disappears for the whole game until the end when he pops up, even though he's illegal. Illegally, not even a gym challenger anymore. He pops up wearing fair uniform and fights you in front of the whole crowd like people from different regions watching as well on TV. Despite not being in the gym challenge, he makes it as your final rival, as the evil counterpart. And you get to fight him on the big screen, him not having legally done the gym challenge. You have. The Game Freak Riders even made a signature Pokemon a psychic type to match his psychic type team but also hit fairy type in the end so that when he loses his entire team and restarts as a fairy gym leader his signature pokemon stays with them leon is shown as this truly undefeatable champion that tell you that he's he won at the age of 10 and that he's he's like he's like a symbol of peace like no one can defeat him all the citizens in the village when stuff is going down they don't even care because they're like leon is around when does this happen in other pokemon games when do they say wow alder and cynthia are around they do nothing Alder didn't even do anything in black and white. And went to Alder and beat Alder up and became champion. Cynthia only does something in platinum. And even then, she doesn't fight Cyrus. You fight Cyrus. It's, oh, Leon's entire character is that the kids shouldn't do anything. Which is the exact opposite of every other game. Where you're 10, 11 and you're riding on Kyogre. Riding up into space and killing Deoxys. Steven is worthless in those games. I'm not. Those games are amazing. I'm comparing it to the soul they put in this game. And then people saying you need more things to complain about. Gym leaders. Truly organized systems. The 18 gym leaders verse each other. The top 8 become the gym leaders for that year. The weakest is the first gym leader. And then they give you reasons for Milo being the first gym leader. He actually holds back. And then in the tournament at the end, Bea beats the sixth gym leader, meaning that the gym leaders always fluctuate. Milo's probably a lot stronger than that. And the gym system works is you fighting gym leaders from their weakest skill, higher up all the way to Raihan, who's more skilled, and all the gym leaders are implied to weaken their team when they verse you. For the first time, gym leaders make sense. Why is Brock pathetic and a Mount Moon trainer can beat him? It's implied, but no one ever explains it. And you beat Brock and he says, Wow, congratulations, go fight Misty now. She's in Cerulean City. There's no hype that you even beat Brock. In this game, everyone is saying a gym leader is undefeatable. You're crazy if you think you can beat one. And once you beat Milo, Hop is so proud. He's like, me and you are gym badge holders now. They, they give a title like it's something truly cool. And as you're walking, the pop-up dot, like everyone is hyping you up. You versus Hop as a gym badge holder and it looks like something powerful. Then when you beat the third gym leader, all the, the first three gym leaders gather and say, this is something special. This is not normal for people to get past where you did. You're a strong trainer. It makes your strength so believable in this game. And this was one of the ma main things I complained about in my rants that we don't even feel like a real main character. We feel like a gag character. And our strength is legit believable in this game. And then the television. They introduce this future idea where everyone has these uh, Rotom phones and everyone's watching TV. And it's a culture where everyone watches these gym battles. That's what you need. You need the whole region to know you're champion. You can't read on the news that Steven was beaten by a 10 year, 11 year old kid. It doesn't sound like something that should bother you. This, because it's a Pokemon game, the entire world also likes Pokemon battles and is watching as someone is climbing through. They know who it is. They have to register with their paperwork. You're gaining more and more fans throughout the story. And when you do beat Leon, I don't even know if you do, the world knows who you are and you're not some nobody and the world loves you. And your power is explained since the beginning. With each gym that you beat, they say it's impossible. This is where everyone loses. With Raihan, they call him the only one who can beat him is Leon. And when you beat him, they say, wow, you beat him just like Leon did. And then even up until the point where you're fighting Leon, they say it's Leon the Undefeatable. The idea of fighting the eight gym leaders to outskill them is, is, in, is genius. It's the way gym leaders should have been. Their Pokemon are weaker on purpose. The only way to beat them is if your skills are better and you're slowly beating the first to eighth gym leader. Of course, you'd be a candidate to be one of the top trainers at the end too. And then getting rid of the Elite Four and making it a, ch a champion cup at the end makes the, the strong trainers that outskilled all the gym leaders 
have a chance to shine. Having a tournament at the end with all the gym challenge winners is, is style points in a game. It's so fun to do tournaments in a game, whether it's Mega Man, Battle Network, or whatever game. Tournaments are so fun, seeing the bracket trainers meeting up to each other. And that is so much more of a, a fun idea to find out who fights the champion rather than having four Elite Four members that don't do anything. Four Elite Four members that should have been able to stop the evil team just with one of them. They kick out the Elite Four and they bring more value to the gym leaders. So the top four gym leaders would be the Elite Four. Raihan, Piers. By the end of the game, I feel like it's Bea and Opal. Those are the four Elite Four members. The game also gives you a special status by calling you the only person the champion has ever endorsed, along with your rival. So even if in the beginning where you start off as a weak trainer, there's still something about you that everyone takes a double take when they see you. And then Champion Rose and Bede, they have like squinted eyes when they look at you, like the champion chose two people. And that gives you a special chosen thing to even start the game, being like, okay, I have something. They made this game like the beginning of a sports season where the entire region is so excited to see these new challengers fight. And it's like any national uh, sports game, basketball, football, whatever. They're coming to each of the games and watching you. It's such a fun system. And then Dynamaxes turn out to be amazing, turn out to be so fun, and you don't get to use them unless you're at a gym battle, pretty much. The way they showed in trailers made it look crap, but in-game, it's like actual boss fight Pokemon, and it's very fun to do. I like it so much, I want them to copy and paste these elements, and when they do the Sinnoh Remix, have these things again. Even the way the story is told, in the beginning, if you pick this game off the shelf, and you don't know anything about Dynamaxing, they show you the beginning where Leon is Dynamaxing his Charizard and then he's fighting someone he calls Raihan and he looks evil so the so as the main character playing you're wondering who this Raihan is or even if he's relevant and then when you make it to the gym ceremony a couple hours in you see Raihan there and they f they give you a flash forward of all the gym leaders which is something they've never done before it's really exciting to see all the gym leaders gathered there because gym leaders seem never gather in other regions and you get to see all the gym leaders you're gonna have to fight on the way and they even tell you their typings and they do this cool thing where they hide one of the gym leaders from you. It's exciting to go and meet them. And then when you meet all the gym leaders, they actually have character and life to them. And they, you can read their lead card and see how they grew up. And they're not a statue that just stands there. The only two uh, gym challengers that, or gym leaders that are statues are Bea and Gordy in the game I, ver in the game I played. Because they're version exclusives. So Game Freak didn't want to make them run around too much because it would change too much of the game. Maybe in the third version... They can have them uh, come out of the gym. But that's already asking for them just because they did so much good. Do even more good. I'm not going to complain about that. Even Kabu, the third gym leader, they said he has the potential or had the potential to be champion. Even though he's the third gym leader. So he's, he's gone down the ranks. And they said that he's dropped to the minor league. So it explains behind the power of these gym leaders that there's a lot more to it. One of my favorite things is the whole conspiracy of the evil team. When you introduce the team yell and you wonder what they're about and... In your mind, the, pretty, the idea is pretty much that Marnie, there is no leader and that Marnie is just this hypothetical leader that they cheer for because they're changing up the formula for the evil team. And then while you're wondering what Team Yell's up about, Team Yell mentions to Hop about how strong Leon is, calling it something like, wow, that's how it is, I guess, when your older brother is not useless, referring to Leon being the champion, which me as the player made me think, does Marnie have an older brother? Did he mean something else when that Team Yell member said that? And it gave me this idea that Marnie had a brother that was useless and Team Yell was formed because of Marnie's backstory of how she has a useless brother and that she, she has this goal to do something. And because Team Yell knows her backstory. So it made me wonder what Marnie's backstory was. Paired up with Marnie telling you that she, she's also from a crappy village like you. I guess crappy they mean just not from the main city. And then when you get Marnie's card you realize she does have a brother. Even though it was speculation in your head and that her brother gave her her more peko, so you wonder where it went wrong. And as you run into Team Yell blocking the way for Marnie to get in the lead, which is also in the game, Team Yell is actually blocking the path. Their goal is to keep Marnie in the lead. And that's why Marnie is one of the lead gym trainers. She's ahead of you and Hop even until you stop Team Yell from interfering. Like that's a depth added to the game that's really fun. When you get her card, you realize that she has a brother and that she's from this place called Spike Mooth. And when you make it to Spike Mooth, you see it's like the slums. It's like, it seems to be like a project housing area. And you realize there that Team Yell are gym trainer, challenger trainers from the seventh gym leader. They're actual gym trainers. That's why they're able to fight you. And that the dark type logo is the Team Yell logo rotated. And that the leader of Team Yell is the seventh gym leader. And also Marnie's brother. And also Marnie's brother is not useless, but a, but formed Team Yell because she's, he's a super fan of her. 
Like, it's such a fun story, and you four as rivals have such different stories and development to you that it makes the game fun and a story to tell. Versus where in the end of X and Y, the only development to, like, Tierno is that he dances. That That's his character. That's not even development. That's just showing a bit of his character. He dances. Shauna is, like, nervous, but I think she likes you, whether you pick a boy or a girl. These aren't developments. They're just, like, one-liners about their character. And then they keep the same character for the whole game. Even Marnie, when, once you... It's so funny. Once you uh, get to the, the champions, the cup, in the tournament, she pretty much does the same thing she hates in Team Yell. Team Yell yelling at the back. She appreciates them, but she's like, stop interfering. And she even gets pissed when she realizes that Team Yell has been trying to help her cheat the gym challenge the whole time. But at the end of the game, she's, she's yelling. She pretty much becomes a Team Yell member, and she's cheering you on, and your stats go up. And it's hilarious. And then the twist in this game, like the seventh gym leader not even being shown in the opening ceremony. So you wonder who that person is. And the reason they don't show it is because he's wearing Team Yell uniform. Like, that's so cool. You guys want to forget about all this and complain and find things to complain about? Go for it. But don't be pissed at me when in the next game they take all this work they put in out and focus on the things you guys complain about. Because people who go out of their way to complain just... Not, not all of you guys, but what people don't realize is complaining is fun. It gives you this feeling of, yeah, I'm analytical, I'm critical. And sometimes you're stupid for doing it. If you, don't, if, if you dislike something, go for it. Express your opinion. But if you're going out of your way to find something that you don't actually support to complain about, it's, it's, it's a stupid thing people do. Like 99% of the people complaining about that tree don't care. Dude, to fix that tree is just a texture. It's the easiest thing to fix. And no one cares about it. The National X being gone is bad, and I have agreed with that and said that they probably have to add as a DLC in order to get the Pokemon fans back on their side because everything they're doing in their game is not being noticed because they hate the National Dex thing. But 90% of the people who are fighting for the National Dex don't even care about the National Dex or want it or even will use it if they add it back. People finding things to complain about is toxic, and then telling me to, to go out of my way and start complaining about things because I'm appreciating the game so much. I don't, I don't want that toxic in my comments. All the twists in this game, like you going into the equivalent of the Elite Four in this game without even having met the true evil in the region. I'm at the Champion Cup and I don't even know what's evil in the game. I know now because I'm like one episode later and I, I know it's Chairman Rose, but the game twisted. It's supposed to, they've never done it like that before. Remember that thing I said about them having probably rewritten this game a few times so that they can make it the best they can? What Chairman Rose mentions at the end of the game, Bede is shown saying in the beginning of the game, implying that Chairman Rose told him, but you're not supposed to notice that unless you're like properly analyzing the game. And that's like little foreshadowings that they threw. The thing about Bede saying, why worry about today when there's the next thousand years at stake? That doesn't mean anything. It's just foreshadowing for later. Another twist, Zashin and Zambas end up popping up in the beginning. The, the area that you see them being called a slumbering wield, and then learning later what that area really means. That it's a slumbering wield because it's a foggy area that no one can go into, and is rumored to be where Zashin and Zamazen to sleep. You and Hop can only go in because they allow it, and you're the only ones who can see the illusions of Zashin and Zamazen because they want you to see them. When does this happen in Pokemon games? The closest that this has ever happened is in black and white, where N gets the opposite dragon from you, but you pick up the sword and your rival picks up the shield, and you actually become the modern day versions of the heroes. They make it a point to say that. They make it a point for the, the audience to properly understand what the mythology is. And they even make the whole mythology conspiracy throughout the game. They start off with you being from a distant town and Sonia coming with you on your journey to, to study the darkest day and everything. You meet the first statue, which is a total like propaganda to hide everything about the story. It's one hero wielding a sword and shield as if he's some medieval knight. But what it really is is two heroes as you continue to play the game, you find out. And not only is it two heroes, but it wasn't even a sword and shield as weapons. It was Zashin and Zamazenta that someone has been trying to hide from existence. All this mystery and fun doesn't happen in other Pokemon games. And if you, I'm appreciating it so much, and I'm playing the game with such a smile. Because as I'm playing this game, it looks like a fan game. It looks too good to be true. And meanwhile, I'm being told that I need to start complaining about things. And then the areas, not only do you have the wild areas, which you can spend so much time in, that I just want them to just literally copy and paste over to Sinnoh remakes, just because they're so fun. But every area is explorable. Instead of going down 10 levels of a cave, you're just going around 
very different looking areas, like ruins, snowy areas, the place where you find the Galarian Yamask and everything. They're all fun areas to explore. They're all unique looking areas. And it's not just a, a simple cave. Meanwhile, just in the last games, uh, Sun and Moon, you've had that thing where you're going in caves and just going up and down 10 levels. And you just want to get out of the cave. When I'm playing this game, I want to continue exploring the equivalent of the caves in this area. There's so much about the game I love. Even at the end, when you when you get to the championship, and it's like the most, it's like E3, the most hype thing ever. You see the security guards there. You see stands out there of people selling merchandise and drinks. It gives you the vibe. The pop-up dialogue is such a good idea, but no one wants to talk about it because they want to complain about stuff and tell me to com be more complaining than appreciative. It's just one idiot in the comments. It's not. It's not my actual subscriber and fan base. Introduction to TRs, which is what TMs used to be, but now they've added two times the amount of TMs by adding TRs that break, and you can only get finite uses out of them. So you have a hundred different moves added as TMs, which are fun to give to your Pokemon. Galarian forms. The world does not appreciate what these games would have been if, just like Megas, they kicked out Alolan forms for Gen 8. If it was just new Pokemon, and we look back at regional variants as something that's missed potential, they literally use that potential in these games. They made Galarian forms for not just Gen 1 Pokemon, but a bunch of Gen 5 Pokemon, and they introduced new evolutions. They did this in an in a attempt to start pouring more passion back in, because the problem with, with previous games is that when they evolve Magmar, they need to give a reason that you couldn't do it before. So they introduced this com complicated, um, ma what is it? You make it hold the item and trade it. That's what they had to do. They were getting stuck, and that's why they had to make such a complicated evolution like Sylveon. They made its evolution complicated to achieve because they didn't want to put too much brain power into figuring something cool out. Now they passionately created this thing where Pokemon will have differently evolved versions that aren't the same Pokemon, so you can do whatever you want with them. You can't evolve our Farfetch into Surfetch, but here's this exactly the same looking Farfetch, but it's slightly different, so it can evolve into Furfetch. Here's a Lanoon, it can evolve a third, a second time. And then they introduce a counterpart to Yamask, which instead of being a ghost, is being possessed, and it has its own evolution. Instead of Galarian Cofagrius, it has Runarigus. Th that, th that stuff doesn't come by pulling it out of your ass. That comes from ambitious, ambitiously trying to create something really cool. That comes from them like working their hardest. So many developers put like their life into this game, and you can see it. And then the music. The music is insane in this game. Even when you're walking through cities and in battles. Like, every gym leader battle is so hype. The crowd chanting in the background. And then when you make it to the 7th gym leader, he has a crazy, like, Team Yell leader theme. And you just look at him as so unique and different. And this game just feels so surreal at every single moment. At least when I'm playing it. And when you make it to the champion, and you're versing Hop in the final, the most tense thing ever. I'm rooting for him to win. But they make completely new music for the championships. And just go and listen to Hop's theme. This, this cool theme plays as it pans around him. And you can just feel the intensity of the situation. And Hop even slaps his face and he's like, Alright, this is, this is everything I've been working for. I have to become champion here. And then the details, like when you beat him, like you feel so bad. that he's, he's so pissed at himself. He's so hurt inside, but then he's, he does this action and then he smiles at you like, you know what, man, you're the better man. There's so much emotion in each of the characters. <laughs> Marnie, Bead, and Hobbs theme all fit their characters so well and are so fun. And their battles are not overdone. You don't verse Marnie and Bead at every corner because they're rivals. They only pop up when they're relevant to the plot. And it makes you excited when they do battle you. It makes you wish they battled you more. And there's so much to this game to appreciate. And it makes me so pissed when someone comments saying, you're complimenting the game too much. You need to you need to start complaining about things. Like, I don't need to do anything. I'll complain. I promised myself that if something popped about that I didn't like, that I would make a I would I would make fun of it. That I would criticize the game. But this game turned out to be com the complete opposite direction. This is the kind of game that people don't appreciate. And it and ends up being a game they wish they would go back to. A game they wish Game Freak would put passion into. Again, like Sword and Shield. If you have something you dislike in the game, feel free to go on Twitter and say, you know, this, this part of the game I just didn't like. Because this is one of the greatest games ever. And I hate that the Pokemon fanbase is so, like, trash right now. That if you're enjoying it too much, that you... 
there's something wrong with you. Even like the animations, how when you use Surf or whatever, that they're quick animations. Not only does that not bother me, but I kind of like that. If there are the options to pick long animations, no animations, or short animations, I would pick short animations. Because there's so many times in Sun and Moon where, out of my moves, I know which one has the longest animation and I don't use it. And we don't use Z-moves at all in Sun and Moon because of the animation. So why do you guys want Pokemon Battle Revolution like animations? Yes, they're beautiful. Yes, they're really cool. I don't want them though. So yeah, we have the Pokemon wandering about the field. We call them kind of symbol encounters where you can... Multiple hits! It keeps dealing damage! The simple animations don't bother me. Yes, do they put less work into animations to make them simple? Yeah. So what? If the next games came out and the tree suddenly looks better and animations are long again, but the story is trash, I'd rather pick, pick this game over it. This game had my emotions totally poured into it that I was literally crushed when in the championship I had to beat Marnie and Hop. And everything they've been talking about for the whole game, you just end right there because they can't become champion. It almost wasn't even fair. Like these are fictional characters, but this game is really getting me because they did such a good job with it. Every small detail, even when you beat Hop, and you go downstairs and you hear the big vibing music. And the first thing you see when you open the elevator doors is Leon doing that stupid pose. It's like, it's, it, just, it just speaks so much. It's like, dude, I know you lost, but everything's cool. Just have a fun time here. This game turned out to be so good. Yes, the national decks is gone. Yes, the animations are short. Yes, there's an ugly looking tree. I don't care. Appreciate the game for what it actually is. And don't tell me to complain about stuff because I'm enjoying it too much. And don't go out of your way to go find something to criticize because you want to be this analytical, super smart guy that isn't a sheep of Game Freak. If you can't appreciate when something is good, then you're a sheep of the people who are stupidly analytical and criti critical of stuff. You're not a sheep if you're enjoying what they're giving to you. You're a sheep if you're following someone else, someone else's opinion.